for today. If I would like to give a title for this morning's message, I'm going to talk on how to walk with God. Can you say amen? You know, most often, as a matter of fact, I want you to know that uh, I would want to humble myself and tell you that uh, before I speak to you on Sunday morning, I first allow God to speak to me on Saturday night. Amen? The message comes to me first before it comes to you. So I'm not speaking to you. God is speaking to us. Amen? You know, that's, that's uh, one of the mistakes that many preachers do. They stand and they preach to the people, not knowing God speaks to them first before they speak to the people. Amen? So God spoke to me last night, and now he's going to speak to you through me. Amen? Let me begin by asking you a question. Is there anyone over here that's walking ahead of Jesus? Put your hands up. If, if you're walking ahead of Jesus, then it simply means he follows you. It shouldn't be so. He should be walking ahead of us and we follow him. Amen? And if we are following him, my brother, my sister, it simply means, now the other thing is, that we have Jesus in us. So if Jesus is in, in us, and if we are going in a direction that we are going uh, to, it means we are led by the Lord on the inside to take us where we are going. If that is so, if that's how we are led, the Lord on the inside is leading me to go where he wants me to go. And if that is so, then what happens? He is going ahead of us, even though he's inside us. He goes ahead of us. And when he goes ahead of us and when he leads us, we are never disappointed in our journey. Many people are disappointed. Why this has not happened? Why that does not happen? Why when I went here, this problem? I went there, this problem? Why this? Why that? My brother, my sister, it's simply because we're not being sensitive enough to listen to the voice of the Spirit on the inside speaking to us and leading us where we should go. We have to be led of the Lord. Romans chapter 9 verse 1, Paul says over here, he says, I say the truth in Christ that I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now look at that verse carefully. There are three different persons mentioned over here. Number one, he says the Holy Ghost. Number two, he says me. And number three, he says I. Let me read that again. I say the truth unto you. I, who is he referring to? He is referring to the actual person Paul or the spirit of Paul. So he says, I, in the spirit, I lie not, because my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. In other words, what Paul is trying to say, he says, whatever I do, it's done by me being led of my spirit. The reason why I do things being led of my spirit, because the Holy Spirit already communicated to my spirit. And my spirit communicates to my conscience. Are you there? Amen. Now that's the reason why most often, you know, we have people that ask you questions. Are you led to do what you're doing? Did you hear from the Lord? How, how is your spirit when you do what you're doing? It's simply what we're trying to say is, whatever is communicated to your spirit and your spirit communicates to your conscience, it's because the Holy Spirit does not speak to your conscience. The Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit. And you be directed by your spirit through your conscience. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is a breath, the length, the depth, and the height of his love. Looking at uh, verse 17, the word dwell. 
In the Greek, it, say, it says house or a, a residing place. Now look at that verse very carefully, and I want you to understand what Paul is trying to communicate in that verse. He says that Christ may dwell, that Jesus Christ may have a house or a home for him to reside. Where? In your hearts. Now what literally blows me away when I begin to think, is there any place better than heaven itself? What a glorious place that is. If you read chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, the uh, John, the revelator, is giving a description of heaven. It's a beautiful place. It's a place where angels are worshipping the Lord. It's a place where the streets are paved with gold. It's a place where it's beyond description to explain. But for Jesus Christ to leave a place such as that, and say, I want to come and dwell in the hearts of these people. I can't understand. He's made our hearts his home. And my brother, my sister, what is the benefit that I reap out of that? When he makes my heart his home, and when he resides on the inside of me, it's heaven on earth. Amen? It's like heaven to me. It's glorious, me having Jesus Christ dwelling on the inside. And then he says that, that you will be rooted and grounded in his love. To be rooted and grounded in his love. Listen, my brothers and sisters, you know, we love a lot of things. How many of you love your cars? Yeah, a couple of hands go up. Thank you, you've been honest. How many of you love your houses? If you don't love it, give it to me. <laughs> How many of you love your jobs? Oh boy, all the hands can go up. So we love our cars, we love our jobs, we love our, we love our houses, we, you know, we love all that. And we also love the Lord. So what we're doing is we're putting the Lord in the same bracket of all the other things that we love. So... Genuinely, we don't love the Lord the way we should be loving Him. We love Him like how we love all the other things. But I want you to know this morning that God expects genuine love. Jesus Christ expects genuine love. How do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, love Him the way He loves us? I mean, He loves us without condition. His love is the agape love. He does not love you because you're good. He does not love you because you're doing mission work. He does not love you because you're, you know, you're coming to church every Sunday. Uh, he loves you no matter what. He loves you if you're bad. He loves you if you're good and if you're ugly. Good, bad, and the ugly. Amen. He loves you just the way he loves you. So what he demands from us that we got to love him the very same way he loves us. Well, how does it happen? Is when we are rooted in him. Amen. When we are rooted in him, then what happens? We are taking out the sap of his love into our lives and we're able to love him the way he loves us. I love him not because he blesses me with a lot of things. I love him because he first loved me. Amen. We got to love him. That's the way we love him. Now let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 33, verse 14 and 15. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give you rest. Everyone say rest. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses said unto the Lord here in this verse, in verse and he said unto him, if thy presence will not go with us, then carry us not hence. So in this verse of scripture, the Lord is telling Moses, he says, Moses, I want to give you and the people along with you rest. And the way that I will lead you to a place of rest is my presence will go with you. Now, I made a study on that word rest from the Old Testament. I want to bring it to you in the New Testament. What is this rest that the Lord is talking about? 
So I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you feel rested? Because the Lord said, he says, I'm going to give you rest. Now you'll be wondering, how do I get this kind of a rest that the Lord is talking about? And in order to find that, go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. And I want you to read verse 10. And when he go over to Jordan and dwell in the land which I which the Lord your God give it unto thee to inherit. And when he give it you rest from all the enemies around the boat, so that you may dwell in safety. Church, please listen to me this morning. The Lord said, I'm going to give you rest. But rest is only found in the land that the Lord promised. That's, what, that's exactly what the verse says. He says, you will find rest when you reach the land. You will not find rest in Egypt. You will not find rest while you're in the wilderness. You will not find rest anywhere else. Rest will be given to you when you reach the land. So the question is, <clears throat> in fact, let's read another verse of scripture also. We'll go to the book of Deuteronomy again, chapter 25. And let's read verse 19. Therefore, you shall be when the Lord thy God had given thee rest from all your enemies round about you in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it that thou shalt blot out the very remembrance of the Amalekites. Amen. So the land is here. And people are journeying from Egypt. They come into the wilderness. They have no rest anywhere. But on, only until and unless they got into the land. So the question is today for you and for me. What is this land that you're talking about pastor? Can you please explain to me about this land? Well this land is none else but the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never have rest except if you found yourself in Christ. Can you say amen? If we are not in Christ, we are restless. You got to obtain Christ. You may say, well, uh, I, I, I think uh, you know, you're making a little mistake. Don't, don't you realize I accepted Jesus Christ? Don't you know that I'm, I'm in Christ? So what do you mean by saying I have to be in Christ? No, I, I'm not asking you that question because I'm going to explain to you as we go on. Go to Exodus chapter 40 and read verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, On the first day of the first month shall thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Now looking at that verse of scripture, it's a new beginning. It's a new month. It's a new start. The Lord says, on the first day of the first month, I want you to set up this tabernacle. The tabernacle for the congregation of the nation of Israel. Now listen, my brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning, that this morning can be a new day for you. It could be a new beginning. You could come to the place where you can rest. Pastor, can you explain to me, what is the meaning of the word rest? You want an explanation to that? Rest. That's rest. Where you are relaxed. Where everything has come to an end. You're not worried about the enemy. It says the enemies that came to attack you will be no more. Amen. Yes, they will still attack you. They will still come after you. But they will not shake you. Amen. Amen. You will not get worried. You will not get disturbed. You are resting. So the Bible says... That you shall have rest in the promised land. Now we just read from Exodus 40 verse 1 and 2. A new beginning, a new experience. Now if you continue to read in chapter 40 of the book of Exodus, 
it says that Moses raised up the tabernacle. And as he raised up the tabernacle, the presence of God came in, the glory of God came in, and even Moses could not stand in the tabernacle because of the presence of God. Now, in the tabernacle, as they journeyed into the wilderness, they still were looking for rest until they reached the promised land. Now, Jesus Christ is the promised land for us. Well, we have received Jesus Christ. But I'm going to ask you as I conclude, you know, have we really obtained, they, op they had to obtain the promised land. Did we really obtain Christ? We have received Jesus Christ, but I don't think some of us have really obtained Christ. In what sense? In the book of Exodus chapter 12, the scripture says, the Lord told the nation of Israel through Moses, he said, I want you to offer an animal and put the blood of the animal on the doorpost and the lintels and partake of the flesh of that animal. Let it be roasted that whole night and then partake of that flesh. Now that was Passover. Now what happened was the children of Israel partook of the Passover lamb. They celebrated the feast of Passover. The first Passover festival celebrated over there. They had the lamb but they still never had the land. So what I'm trying to tell you today is we have celebrated the Passover in the very same way they have celebrated, which means they had deliverance from bondage, deliverance from Pharaoh, deliverance from the house of Egypt, but they still never obtained total rest. Are you connecting the dots? We have been delivered. We have accepted Jesus Christ. We are no more in Egypt. We are no more under bondage. We just had the land, but we still never had the land. Because the land is what gives us rest. And so the lamb is just the beginning. The land is the final. The Alpha and Omega. Amen. As we continue, is there rest? That you have received, but not obtained Christ. Is there any peace or is there no peace? My brother, my sister, if you would begin to say, I have no peace. How many of you would have made those statements? How many of you think you're in a situation like, I have no peace. I have no peace in my house. I have no peace at my work spot. I have no peace. Everywhere I go, there's no peace. My brother, my sister, if there's no peace, it simply means you only had the lamb, but you're not in the land. And in the land, you get rest. In the land, you get peace. In the land, you get everything that you need. Amen. The book of Romans chapter 6, verses say over there, when Jesus Christ died, we died. When Jesus Christ was buried, we were buried. When he arose, we arose. How does it happen? It happens at baptism. When Jesus Christ died, we have to identify with his death. How do we identify with his death? When I go through baptism, I'm identifying with his death. And when I identify with his death, he is buried. And when I'm buried under the water, I identify with his death. And when Jesus Christ rose, I identify with his resurrection. So I'm born again. I've accepted Jesus Christ. I identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. But I may not have his ascension. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace are we saved. I think that's a printing error over there. It actually mentions by grace are we saved. We're always sliding. Not, not sliding in the right direction, we are backsliding. Amen. Verse 6, And I raised us up together with him, and made us to sit together with him 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My brother, my sister, if I am ascended with Christ, then I'm seated in Christ, with Christ, in heavenly places. And if that's where I am, then I want you to know that every demonic force is under my feet. The devil is not on my head. Why do we have to come and say, Pastor, the devil is playing havoc in my house. The devil is having a wonderful time in my house. Demons are let loose in my house. My brother, my sister, that's a wrong statement. If I know that I'm seated with Christ and in heavenly places, then he has no place over there. Amen? All that I know that whatever he tries, he has to try it under my feet because he's under my feet and that's where he belongs. And that's where he stays. And that's why he has to be. And my brother, my sister, we are walking all over the devil. Hallelujah. He has no access in my house. He has no access anywhere else. He has been subdued by the power of God that is in us. We are above and never beneath. We must have rest. And we can only have rest when we ascend and be seated over there. But sometimes we don't find ourselves over there. The reason why we don't find ourselves there is because we are not rooted with him. We are rooted somewhere else. Let's ask ourselves, where am I rooted? Uh, Let's look at the company of my friends that I have. If I have friends that are worldly and if I'm with them, if I'm with them, I got to be with them. To get them to know Jesus Christ. But if I want to be part of them. My brother, my sister. I have shifted my root system. I am rooted in the wrong company. I am rooted with the wrong people. And I am getting along with them. And when this begins to happen. My brother, my sister. We are not there. We are here. And if this is where I am. I have opened a door wide for the devil to come. And to have a wonderful time in my house and in my life. I need to close every door. Amen. I need to show the devil the exit. Give him the walking ticket. Tell him to get lost. Leave my house. Leave my family. Why? Because I'm going up to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. At the very beginning, I want want to tell you this morning that there's a lot of sacrifices that we got to make. And some of the sacrifices are going to be painful. We got to detach from bad company. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'll say it over and over again. Detach from bad company. Detach from people who we should not be, you know, mingling along with. Let's begin to watch the way we talk. Because when we are with that company, we talk the way they talk. Our language begins to change. Our ways and habits begin to change. So we need to, you know, move out from there and start moving to where God wants us to be. We need to start arising and going to the heavenly places to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. And my brother, my sister, Jesus Christ said, he said, when you come there, when you come where I am, then he says, I want you to know that when I ascended, that's in chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, from verse 19 onwards, he says, when I ascended, I ascended far above principalities, every power, every name, every dominion, every kingdom that's named. He says, I've ascended far above all that, and now I am seated in heavenly places, not as a victim, but as, as a conqueror, and I'm raising you up also to be seated with me, and what makes what this makes you up, it makes you to be more than a conqueror. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The next verse, verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. I love that verse of scripture. It says, we are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors. 
More than conquerors. You know what's the definition of that verse? More than conquerors. It means you're winning a battle which you never fought. Amen. You're winning a battle which you never fought. Well, pastor, who fought that battle? You never fought the battle with the devil. Jesus Christ did. You never smashed his head. Jesus Christ did. You never put him under, under your feet. He put him under his feet, whereby he got you and me who are seated with him to get him under our feet as well. So that's what makes us more than a conqueror. So Paul says, he says, all these things do not disturb us because one thing we know, he says, through all these things, we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. Now look at the next verse, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death no life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. And look at the last verse. It says, no height, no, no depth, uh, no other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My brother, my sister, we are so bonded with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so kind of attached, you know, we are so glued with the love of Jesus Christ that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. You, you need to be walking with the Lord on a daily basis. Amen? It's only then we are going to see victory. It's only then we are going to see great things happen in our lives. So today, as I gave you this message, I want to encourage you to start moving, shifting tracks. You've been walking in the wrong direction. Now shift tracks. Start walking with the Lord. I want you to start making your ascension to heaven itself. You know, we need to dig our roots out from wherever we are rooted. The strongest system of the full tree. It's not the branches. It's not the fruit. It's the root. If we don't have roots, we can't bear fruit. So the question is, where are we rooted? If you are rooted in Christ, you bear the fruit of the Spirit of God. If you are rooted elsewhere, there is no good fruit. Amen? Shall we all stand please? Amen. You know, for marriages, we have uh, a lot of uh, illustrations. And one of the illustrations that people use for marriage is in New York. A little boy was walking down the road somewhere at midnight. The police stopped by and asked the boy, Who are you? What are you doing here? The little boy said, they asked him, uh, from where do you come? He said, I'm coming from hell. Who's your father? My father's the devil. So they got a little worried. Who's your mother? My mother's a demon. Where do you stay? In hell. You want to see? I'll take you there. So they said, yes. So they put a little boy in, his, in the car, in the police car. They drove him, and as they came close to the gate, they heard pots and pans flying. And the mother told her husband, Why